Welcome back to MS Neuro TV by MS Fusion News, sponsored by Sanofi Genzyme, Biogen, and Celgene. We're so glad that um, many of you are joining us again here today. My name is Anna Fernandez de Castro, and I am the Assistant Development Coordinator at MS Fusion News. And I'm here today with our Director of Development, Jennifer Falk. MS Views and News is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing education and information to the multiple sclerosis community. Today, we're welcoming back Dr. Donald Nagroski as he gives us an overview of today's MS therapy options. He'll also be going into detail about their efficacy and safety and answering questions that we all have, such as, well, what makes all these injectables different from each other? Dr. Nagroski has been a neurologist for 32 years and is the medical director of the Multiple Sclerosis Center of Sarasota in Florida. He is also the clinical assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Science at Florida State University's College of Medicine. Dr. Nagroski has made numerous contributions to clinical trials and has been an expert presenter both nationally and internationally in the field of MS. His achievements have earned him multiple awards and is, yearly list, and is listed yearly in the Guide to America's Top Physicians. So first, we'll begin by playing a 10-minute interview with Dr. Nagroski. And once the video has finished, Dr. Nagroski himself will be available for a 15-minute Q&A with all of you attending today. We just ask that you please keep your questions on topic and complete the quick survey at the end of the webinar. Again, we'd like to thank Sanofi Genzyme, Biogen, and Celgene for making this program possible and supporting our MS community. Okay, let's begin. Welcome to MS Neuro TV, presented by MS Views and News. MS Neuro TV is a comprehensive educational program bringing together MS professionals from across the United States covering the topics that you want to learn more about. To register for MS Neuro TV webinars, visit www.msviewsandnews.org. Thank you. We hope you enjoy the program. Dr. Nagroski, welcome back for another round of, uh, of questions that I have for you. What can you tell us about the injectable therapies? Yes, for some, this is like old news already, but for others, they still wanna know about it. What can you tell us? What kinds there are? What kind of MS you need to have in order to do these therapies? Are they subcutaneous? Are they intramuscular? How many times a week are they taken? So this is very simple to cover in five to 10 minutes, a whole decades of therapies, and it's, it's basically impossible to cover in 10 minutes, but what I'm gonna do is give you kind of a bird's eye view. First of all, uh, the drugs uh, that I'm gonna speak about, uh, patients should kind of refer to the FDA guidelines in terms of their use and the package insert uh, provided uh, for safety and benefit and the way the drugs work and monitor monitoring, but the injectables were the first MS drugs to change the disease course. The first one called beta seron came out in 1993. It was FDA approved in 1993. Before that time, we had no medications that actually changed the disease course. That's why we call it uh, disease modifying therapies. It's not a disease cure, it modifies the disease. So the first one was beta seron. It's called an interferon. So there are uh, 10 separate injectables that we have now uh, for MS. So the majority of them are interferons, 
and uh, what's an interferon? An interferon is a, everyone has interferons in their body. It's a naturally occurring substance and they produce different interactions with cells. So uh, the MS interferons are a specific type of interferon. So you have beta seron that's administered under the skin um, uh, every other day. And uh, it's, it's uh, so I'll get into the, the uh, subcutaneous side effects of the class of medication. The second interferon that came out is a little bit different. It's called Avonex. It was an injection in the muscle, not under the skin, and that's given once a week. There is a new formulation of Avonex called Plegridi, where they added a molecule to the interferon molecule, and what that does, it, it prolongs the biological effect of the interferon in the body. So since it lasts longer, what happens? You can use it less frequently. So that's a, a subcutaneous injection of uh, a medication similar to Avonex. So uh, another interferon that came along is Rebif. It's a higher dose of interferon, and that's given three times a week, again, under the skin. So those are kind of the, the interferons. There's a, uh, a medication called Extavia, which is a generic form of beta seron. It's basically similar to beta seron, but it's a generic uh, form. So because interferons are injected under the skin, you can have skin reactions. So people don't realize that the skin is a very important organ. Uh, so the skin is there to protect you from infections. And when you damage the skin, there's a lot of immune cells in the skin, underneath the skin layers. So if you're injecting a interferon, even though you have interferons in your body, it's, it could be a, like a foreign substance, and it can cause redness and soreness at the ejection site. But over time, that tends to wear, wear down, wear off. So that's the big thing with interferons. They're subcutaneous injections, and they can cause skin irritation. And they can also cause other things, but that's, uh, that, that's beyond the scope of, of this uh, short uh, kind of talk. So let's uh, change classes. Uh, the other class is called glutarimer acetate. It's not an interferon. It's a uh, amino acids sequence, random four amino acids over and over and over and over again. And that's injected uh, under the skin as well. So uh, as a result, uh, it's initially given every uh, day. Uh, but then they came out with a new formulation that's given three times a week. It's called Copaxone 40. The original one was Copaxone 20. Lately to the market, there are two, uh, two other uh, generics. Copaxone uh, 20, there's a generic for that, Glutarimer Acetate 20. And recently there's a 40, uh, generic 40 uh, Copaxone. So the other uh, medication that's a little bit different, uh, uh, it, even though it's an injection, it's Zimbrida. Zimbrida is the newest uh, kind of subcutaneous drug to the market. Zimbrida works completely different than the other ones. It's a, what's called a monoclonal antibody, which means uh, there's a specific receptor it attaches to in cells, specific cell that it goes after. And this cell is called interleukin. And it attaches to this interleukin thing. So what does that mean? That means uh, when you have MS cells that are overactive, they, they build up and build up and build up. And interleukin is an important kind of chemical in your system to prevent these cells from building up. So it kind of indirectly decreases the MS cells in, in your system. The thing with Zimbrida, uh, that's administered subcutaneously, uh, but uh, there is a what's called a, a program, uh, REMS program, which is risk uh, uh, mitigation strategy because it can elevate liver enzymes and you need a liver enzyme blood test every month before the drug is actually shipped out to the patient every month to make sure that they don't get into trouble. 
So these so subcutaneous or IM injections, uh, there are three classes, as I mentioned. There's the interferons, uh, the glitirimer, and then the new kit on the block is Zimbrida. They all work by completely different mechanisms. The interferons, as a group, are very complex how they work. Uh, as I mentioned, they first came out, the first one in 1993, and every few years we find that the interferon does something else in the immune system. It works on T cells, which are these anti or these inflammatory cells that go haywire in MS patients, right? And so, um, so they, it works differently. It may prevent uh, the cells from getting into the brain. It may work inside the brain. So the interferons can do a lot of different things. Uh, copaxone or glitirimer works differently. It shifts the immune cells from the, the bad immune cells to kind of the good immune cells, what's called Th1 to Th2 shift. So that works a little bit differently. And Zabrida, I already mentioned how that, that works. Dr. Negroski, thank you very much for doing this interview series with us for 2018. <laughs>so that was some terrific and important information um, in that video thank you this is jennifer falk i'm the director of development over at ms views and news um, so now it's time for you all to type in your questions for your q a um, we're going to have dr negroski uh, with us in a minute as i see your questions coming in I will then relay them over to Dr. Negroski. And I just remind you to please try to keep your questions on topic. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible tonight in the order that they're received. And uh, you can type in your questions. Uh, if you see, there is a GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where it should say question box. Um, and it should say something like type your question here. If you don't see that, you can click on the little small orange arrow. You might see that um, on the top of your screen or in the corner, and that should make the question box available to you guys. Okay, so now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Negroski. Welcome, Dr. Negroski. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Am we can. Through? Yes. Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be here with uh, everyone tonight as we open up uh, this talk on interferons uh, for questions and Copaxone, the injectables. And first of all, I want to thank uh, MS Views and News, uh, particularly uh, Jennifer as well as Stuart, and I appreciate uh, Anna's uh, kind introductions. Uh, before I get started, I just want to uh, update everyone about one thing. The drug Zimbrida, uh, I mentioned, uh, has been uh, discontinued from the market by the manufacturer. Uh, so uh, that is no longer a option for uh, therapy. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that with us. And, and we're so glad to have you here with us tonight. Um, this is such important and valuable information that everyone wants to, to learn more about. So uh, we do have a lot of people on the line and we have questions coming in. So I'm gonna start. Um, I have a question that, the first question is saying, when should you decide to change from injections to, to a new infusion therapy? So that is a question that uh, neurologists and patients have been struggling with for, for a long time. Um, so now that we have about 16 FDA-approved drugs on the market, uh, we have options of therapy. So the uh, thing that has come um, across the neurologist's desk recently, as well as the patient's, is that there are now some recent practice guidelines on disease-modifying therapies for adults with MS uh, published by the American Academy of Neurology. And that uh, actually was published uh, online April 23rd, just last month. 
um, and uh, it's it kind of uh, gets to some of those uh, specific questions. So the the if I could just briefly go over the way these guidelines have been been put together, yes. uh, a group of uh, uh, experts in MS uh, uh, met and they kind of looked at all the scientific data on various treatments for uh, MS, indications, side effects, things like that. And then they started to tier the recommendations. And, and if you happen to look at the guidelines, there's different levels of recommendation. Uh, level A is strong uh, evidence to support the conclusion. B is good evidence. C is weak evidence. U is insufficient mm -hmm. evidence. So if there's a level A recommendation, in general, uh, neurologists kind of must uh, follow that. Uh, B is should follow it, and C may follow it. So when it comes to uh, escalation of therapy for, uh, for various reasons, drug failures or tolerance, most of the recommendations are B, which means you should do it, um, and it doesn't say you must do it. So there's some leeway there for the patient as well as the neurologist to come up with the, the answer to that question. So in general, uh, we're kind of, uh, because of the, the benefit of these drugs, uh, a lot of neurologists uh, that treat uh, MS patients they really don't want any evidence of disease activity for relapsing patients. And uh, that means no relapses, no MRI activity, and no progression of disability. That's kind of the, 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 kind of the trifecta that we strive for tra uh, treating patients. Mm -hmm. So what if you're on a particular drug and you have a relapse or two and you're on the drug for at least a year and you're taking the drug as you should, is that enough to trigger a uh, discussion with your neurologist to change? And the answer is yes. What if you're on the drug and you for a year and your 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 MRI shows uh, three or two more lesions, clear lesions that were obvious that weren't there before that are now obvious? And uh, should you have that conversation? And the answer is you should have that conversation with your neurologist about changing therapy. And obviously, if you can't uh, tolerate the medication that you're on uh, because of uh, whatever side effects um, and, and you just don't like the side effects and you're not taking them or if you don't like in, injections anymore and it doesn't fit your lifestyle, then you should have that conversation and think about changing. So to summarize, there's no right or wrong answer, but we're leaning to uh, uh, use very effective medicines uh, to calm down relapses, uh, MRI activity, as well as disability. Okay, terrific, thank you. And um, just to add to that, anyone that's interested in reading uh, further and finding out more information about uh, the new recommendations. The American Academy of Neurology has a website. You can look that up. You can Google that, American Academy of Neurology, and you can look at um, new recommendations and guidelines, um, and they have a slideshow and they have some comprehensive uh, information for all of you to, to look further into, so that's available to you as well. Um, so I do have some more questions for you, Dr. Nagroski. Um, let's see here. Which is the best medication to start on if you have not yet began an MS therapy? So uh, the question is, uh, you know, do you use a medication that uh, has been around for a while, has a long track record, or do you use a kind of a newer medicine that doesn't have as long a track record in terms of safety and, you know, the, the bad things that can happen with any drug. So uh, that conversation has to be carried out uh, uh, by the neurologist, but more importantly, the patient and their care partner have to be on board 
because I have some patients that want the safest drug in the world, and uh, and I have some patients that will want the latest and greatest drug, uh, and they'll put up with potential unknown uh, side effects that could be mild or could be very uh, severe. So in order to answer that, I have to get in a patient's head, so to speak, to try to see where they're coming from. And it's... Uh, it, it gets back to the first talk I gave uh, with the shared decision-making. Mm -hmm. uh, the patient and caregiver have to be on board with the neurologist, and it's a, a team approach to come up with the right drug uh, for the right patient. So to summarize, there's no one drug that's right for everyone, and it is truly a individual disease, as you know. If yeah. you go to... Um, MS meetings, the person uh, with MS to the right of you and to the left of you have a completely different course, different symptoms, and may be on different medications. So it's a very variable and uh, it's a difficult question to answer, but, I, but you have to have that conversation mm -hmm. with everyone involved. Finding what works for the individual. I have another question. Um, is is Ocrevus considered an injectable? Uh, Ocrevus is not a injectable. It's a infusion drug that's uh, given through the vein. So uh, that's going to come up uh, in another talk uh, for your symposium, the MSTV uh, Neuro TV talks, mm -hmm. and that uh, Ocrevus will be covered at that time. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, someone is asking if if you notice a physical decline in a patient and they are not on a disease modifying therapy, do you think physical ability will decline with or without medication? Well, the goal with medication is to lessen the, the rate of decline of physical disability. Um, and uh, the flip side of the coin is what if you, uh, you're you on a medication for many years and you don't have any relapses and you don't have any more MRI activity uh, and you have some uh, disability, do you stop the drug? Uh, so not only do you start it, uh, but if you're stable, or do you stop it? And the new recommendations kind of speak to that. Uh, not only switching, but uh, discontinuation of MS therapies. Mm -hmm. And and that level is a level B in terms of should. Uh, uh, clinicians uh, should advocate that patients that are stable, that is no relapses, no disability progression, and stable imaging should continue on their current uh, treatment unless the physicians decide therapy off is warranted. So there's been a few uh, studies where patients don't have any relapses uh, and were taken off the drug and they continued not to have any relapses, but there was a increased disability as time goes on. Mm -hmm. So personally, I think uh, a patient that has increasing disability as time goes on that has relapsing MS should be on an MS therapy okay, to excellent. begin with. And then the flip side is if they're already on therapy and they're doing fine, then you should have the conversation with the neurologist if you should actually stop it or just continue with what you're on. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have someone asking about Copaxone. Um, 20 versus 40, um, as a patient with side effects, especially flu-like or joint pain, what are your thoughts, uh, I guess, with side effects of uh, Copaxone as an injectable and changing the dosage? So uh, Copaxone is uh, the uh, initial way Copaxone was administered was uh, through the, the, the small needle under the skin on a daily basis. So you can have injection site reactions and then some uh, uh, every now and then you can have 
some atrophy of the uh, skin. The interferons tend to have more of the generalized flu-like symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, kind of the, the uh, you know, myalgia, flu-like symptoms, stuff like that. You get that with more of the interferons than copaxone. So copaxone, in terms of the injection site reactions, they came out with uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday injections uh, three times weekly with double the dose. And surprisingly, you had less skin reactions with the higher concentration, but less frequent administration. And it kind of makes sense because you inje don't uh, inject as frequently. Yeah. So, um, so there's reasons for Copaxone uh, 40 uh, and Copaxone 20. Okay, great. And and moving uh, on from that, I have another question. And I know you touched on uh, generic injectables versus uh, brand name. Someone is asking, uh, is there a difference? And do you know if generics are as effective as the originals? Uh, that is difficult to answer for a couple uh, reasons. Uh, the Generics are the FDA use, uh, uses this term biosimilar, biosimilar. So there's specific scientific uh, definitions of what that means. So um, it's it hasn't been these uh, generics have not been studied in the same vigor as the initial pivotal trials with Copaxone that they gave the patients the brand name. Uh, drug Copaxone at the time and compared them to placebo. So those studies um, uh, are uh, difficult to replicate in today's world. So the manufacturing process with the drug, these biological agents are very complex. So it's, it's hard to answer that question um, uh, if they're identical or biosimilar and do they have the same side effects? But more importantly, in my mind, do they provide the same uh, same benefit? Um, the FDA, I can't speak to them directly, but they have let the generics on the market, uh, so they are available. Um, and I think it depends on the patient and the individual neurologist uh, comfort level, whether they would recommend a generic or uh, a non-generic treatment. Okay, I hate great. to be vague uh, with that answer, but that's it's um, it's a kind of a gray area these days. Okay, we understand that. Um, I, I we'll move towards our final question. Um, this goes by so quickly. Uh, we have someone asking kind of a double question. Uh, do any injectables use auto injectors, and do skin skin reactions ever stop or do you recommend switching when uh, the skin reaction is, is chronic? So uh, many of the uh, injectables do have auto injectors. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the newer auto injectors even have uh, computer chips in as that they could, uh, you can download your injection uh, portfolio, so to speak, into the computer and the neurologist can kind of follow along. So there's the, uh, there's some cool things with the uh, auto injectors. In general, uh, my patients tend to like the auto injectors because they tend to uh, have kind of less side effects than the old fashioned just needles under the skin. Although I do have uh, several patients that just love the old fashioned way that they inject and they don't want anything new. Uh, in terms of the side effects, if you do have persistent injection site reactions uh, month after month after month, in my experience, what happens is that the patients tend not to be compliant. And I think that's the worst, uh, one of the worst things a patient can do is, is not take the drug because it won't work to the full extent if you don't take it. So if you truly have an injection site reactions, you got to talk to your doctor to think uh, if uh, you should change uh, to a different method of administration. Well, excellent. All right. Thank you, Dr. Nagroski. This has been extremely informative, and thank you for updating us um, 
we value this very much. Uh, if it goes by so quickly. We have so many people on the line asking questions, and we thank all of you out there as well. Um, so uh, thank you very much for this evening, Dr. Nagroski, and um, we're going to uh, pass it over to Anna Christina now. Uh, who will give us some final information and, and thoughts. So thank you. Welcome. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. And thank you so much, Dr. Nagroski. It was a pleasure having you tonight. Um, and we'd also like to thank all of you who have joined us here today for our fifth webinar of MS Neuro TV. Please complete the brief survey that will appear as soon as the webinar has finished. Your feedback is important to us so that we can continue to customize our events around you. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, June 5th at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We will be welcoming back MS nurse practitioner Megan Weigel as she discusses pain management. If you're watching today's webinar live, then congrats, you're already registered for the entire series. If you're not registered for the series yet, you can find the registration link on our website, Facebook page, or in this, in this video's YouTube description. This video will soon be uploaded on our MS Fusion News YouTube learning channel. So please don't forget to subscribe to our channel to stay updated. You can also follow us through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For more information on our events and what's new in the world of multiple sclerosis, please visit us at www.msvn.org. And last but not least, we'd like to say thank you so much to Sanofi Genzyme, Biogen, and Celgene for making this program possible. And again, thank you everyone for joining us here today, and we'll see you all next month. Bye-bye.